our second speaker is Benedetta Carnaghi, who is temporarily a PhD student in history. We're expecting her to come in. Um, <laughs> Benedetta works um, on memory and, I'm <laughs> sorry, uh, she's been working on memory with Professor um, Enzo um, Traverson, who is here in the audience. We're very happy to have you, Enzo, back from New York. Um, and her talk today will be, um, Benedetta has been working, I was reading, this is very interesting, um, she's been working on double agents um, in the Second World War, uh, especially how uh, these agents would um, filter um, resistance um, fighters to incarcerate them. Um, it's a very creepy topic to work on, but I'm kind of fascinated by this idea. Um, anyway, her talk today uh, for us is titled Hegemony is Not Dead, Gramsci, Political Islam, and the Contradictory Nature of Consent. discuss with you a work in progress on Gramsci's notion of hegemony and the way scholars have taken it from its original historical context and applied it to more recent geopolitical events. It is important to note that um, the set of problems he posits is not isolated, but rather inscribed within a larger reflection on the relationship between power and domination. The argument I'm in the process of developing, so you know, this is a work in progress, it's not done yet, is that Gramsci's notion of hegemony remains a viable analytical framework for the study of the contemporary geopolitical sphere, even if it must not be automatically and uncritically applied to the present. I was impressed by the way Gramsci's specter haunts the United States. Um, Michele Filippini criticizes the fact that the prison notebook has become some sort of toolbox from which everybody feels entitled to copy, paste his or her favorite citations to justify this or that position. And I'd like to avoid being included in such a stereotype, and rather, let's say, uphold Filippini's second explanation for Gramsci's fortune, which is this. Uh, this proliferation of usages of this theory signals a persistent core of the Gramscian heritage, which reproduce, reproduces itself in variable forms but seizes some of the contradictions of our time. So I think that the concept of hegemony is part of this hardcore. In order to maintain the appropriate critical distance, I want to briefly clarify what hegemony means according to Gramsci. So is this definition uh, univocal or ambiguous? Is there a difference between hegemony and domination, and how is consent achieved within an hegemonic system? My study also argues that the notion of hegemony evolved at the time of the shift from a world divided between East and West to one divided between North and South, approximately at the end of the Cold War. And I'm talking about South as a purely geopolitical concept, so replacing the old concept of Third War. And I intend to present some examples, some concrete examples, to substantiate my argument. For the first one, I limit myself to reminding you of the works on the relationship between Gramsci and postcolonial studies, including Michele Filippini's Global Gramsci, Gramsci Globale, Jane Chambers' Esercizi di Potere, Gramsci Saide Postcoloniale, so power exercises, Gramsci Saide and the Postcolonial, and then Ranajit Guha's Dominance Without Hegemony, History and Power in Colonial India. I do not have the space here uh, to delve into such a huge literature, but I just want to briefly mention the case of British colonialism in India. The latter was an example of dominance without hegemony in Guha's formulation because the British wielded their power without establishing a cultural hegemony in the Indian society. And Guha discusses the Indian independence movement and technique of non cooperation in Gramscian terms. So that I found that very interesting as a counter hegemonic strategy. And I'm going to read you a quote from that. Its aim was, on the one hand, to mobilize the masses in order to destroy the structures of collaboration by which colonialism had hoped to endow its dominance with hegemony. On the other hand, it was essential for that mobilization to be based on persuasion in order to entitle the nationalist elite to speak for all of Indian society. The instrument which was to promote that counter-hegemonic counter strategy on behalf of the leading bloc 
was the Indian National Congress. Its function, defined in Gramscian terms, was to serve as the organ by which the bourgeoisie would want to exercise its leadership before winning governmental power. So that's his reference to Gramsci, which I found very interesting. My second example, of which I'd like to elaborate a little bit more, deals with the case of political Islam as a form of counter-hegemony to the domination of the North over the global South. So this is my question. How does Islam, especially in its radical form, because now we are, we're dealing with that, reenact Gramsci's scheme by painfully challenging the existing order and everybody's critical understanding of their own self-consciousness? Which kind of hegemony does Islamic fundamentalism fight? That's a that's question. It does not seem to be the hegemony of the West, but rather a set of secular ideologies and political movements that have failed in past decades, such as nationalism, socialism, or pan-Arabism. And my biggest problem, which I have not solved yet, is how to use Gramsci's categories to define a movement whose hegemonic ambition is rooted in religion. So, that's the case. So let's, let's start with Gramsci. So Gramsci's problem was that after the defeat of the re European revolutions of the 1920s, he realized that the state in the West was something radically different from the Tsarist autocracy. So in the West, the state was a coercive machine with deep roots in civil society, which built a consensus at the ideological, political, and, cultu and cultural levels that Gramsci called hegemony. So for this reason, he says that a simple war of maneuver, so a direct attack on the existing power structures, was not enough in the West. The final assault needed to be preceded by a war of position, so namely the achievement of an intellectual and cultural hegemony of the proletariat in civil society. So without obtaining the latter, the proletariat could never obtain political power. The definition of hegemony appears in the more theoretical section of the prison notebooks, the section that Perry Anderson called the most celebrated passages of all, and in which Gramsci compared the political structures of East and West and explained how best to generate a revolution in these two sides of the world. <coughs> While there is no doubt that Gramsci started from the Marxist connotations on the notion of hegemony, its original application to the perspectives of the working class in a bourgeois revolution against a feudal order, he extended the concept to the mechanism of bourgeois rule over the working class in a stabilized capitalist society. So basically, Gramsci used his argument to analyze the already existing hegemony of the bourgeoisie over the working class. In Anderson's words, the novelty of Gramsci's approach rests in the fact that he applied the concept of hegemony to a differential analysis of the structures of bourgeois power in the West. So we're back to this East-West divide, to represent which Gramsci borrows the image of the centaur from Machiavelli. So the dialectical relationship between West and East is translated in a dual perspective in the political action carried out in these two spheres, which corresponds to the dual nature of Machiavelli's centaur, half animal and half human. Um, basically, this image represents the revolutionary party and its relationship to the state. So, I quote, the party must pull together in a dialectical unity the two levels of force and of consent, authority and hegemony, violence and civilization, of agitation and of propaganda, of tactics and strategy. So there are always the two sides. So, in this part of Gramsci's text, the term domination, or authority, if we refer to this passage, appears as the antithesis of hegemony. And Gramsci seems to be suggesting that capitalism ruled not only through physical violence, but also through some sort of intellectual coercion, so ideology. And the bourgeoisie's strongest weapon was its hegemonic coercion and hegemonic culture, so namely a code of values and norms that quickly became everybody's common sense. And Gramsci argued that people of all classes, including the working class, ended up identifying their own values with the bourgeois ones. And thanks to this identification process, the status quo was upheld. And Anderson concludes that the idea of hegemony acquired in Gramsci a powerful cultural emphasis, and when combined with his theoretical application of it to traditional ruling classes, it produced a new Marxist theory of intellectuals. And Gramsci argued that one of the functions of intellectuals was to mediate
mediate the hegemony of the exploited classes over the exploited classes via the ideological system of which they were the organizing agents. And it's interesting to think that Gramsci was himself to exercise such a cultural hegemony after his death with the incredible fortune that the notebooks had. However, when it comes to the functions that domination and hegemony or moral <coughs> direction are supposed to exercise, we stumble into some contradiction, or antinomies as Perry Anderson calls them. Gramsci asks what the side of hegemony is, and his first answer is that it pertains to civil society, while domination <coughs> is a matter of the state. Hegemony consists in the, I quote, spontaneous consent given by the great masses of the population to the general direction imposed on social life by the dominant fundamental group. Domination, in contrast, becomes the apparatus of, of state coercive power which legally enforces discipline on those groups who do not consent either actively or passively. But this interpretation does not remain the same throughout the notebooks. So, so Gramsci did not use the antinomies of state and civil society univocally. And the same can be said of hegemony and domination, because there are places where Gramsci speaks of hegemony not as a pool of consent in contrast to another of coercion, but as, as itself a synthesis of the two, so a synthesis of consent and coercion. And Gramsci is further reorienting the concept of hegemony towards the advanced capitalist countries of Western Europe and the structures of bourgeois power within them, in particular parliamentary democracy, which is peculiar to the West, according to him. Gramsci also introduces another distinction between political hegemony and civil hegemony, the first pertaining to the state and the second to civil society. So this seems to contradict what he had written before, that is, that hegemony only pertains to civil society and not to the state. And there is another part of the notebook where he this distinction between civil and political society disappears altogether. So, basically, Anderson's conclusion is that this apparent slippage between hegemony, domination, state, civil society, political hegemony, and civil hegemony is neither accidental nor arbitrary, and the free distinct version of hegemony that we have seen in the three, in the three passages correspond to a fundamental problem, problem for Marxist analysis of the bourgeois state, which Gramsci underlines without providing an adequate answer to it. So Anderson believes that Gramsci is basically himself aware of the aporia of these solutions. Given the way um, the prison notebooks were put together, so written by Gramsci in prison in his cryptic handwriting and in more than 30 notebooks, then smashed a lot of prisons in the 1930s and then published posthumously in the 1950s, I would argue that the issue of what Gramsci really meant by hegemony remains open to interpretation. In my opinion, Gramsci really offers insights into the relationship between power and culture. And yet for me, the greatest value of Gramsci's theory is that it underlines the contradictory nature of consent, which involves, I quote, mixing approbation and apathy, resistance and resignation. So the Italian theoreticians were thinking about the consent that the masses gave to capitalism or even to the fascist dictatorship through the church, trade unions, schools, and other organizations. And in the wake of the terrorist attacks in Paris, I wondered whether it would be possible to apply Gramsci's conceptualization of hegemony and consent to political Islam and the war on terror. So in our different perception of the world, there are also hegemonies and counter-hegemonies. The northern powers have consolidated their hegemony over the international system, while the global south has been largely marginalized. Mohamed Ayyub has shown that it is in this context that political Islam has risen to prominence as an ideology capable of challenging the north's domination not only in the domain of ideas, but of political action as well. And Islam offers, in the eyes of his adherents and sympathizers, a more just alternative international order to the present one. Ayub quotes 19th century scholar and activist Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, who is identified with the notion of pan-Islam, and was a leading precursor of contemporary Islamist activities, because he was a pioneer in terms of using the vocabulary of Islam in order to mobilize Muslim populations against colonial domination. And he notes the weather that political Islam suffers from a major shortcoming when compared to socialism, for instance, because it doesn't have potential universal appeal. It appeals only to countries that are preponderantly Muslim. Nevertheless, it is possible to see a direct relationship between Gramsci's conceptualization of cultural hegemony and Islam, seen as a growing counter-hegemony in the global south. Ayub 
explains how the presence of an ideolo ideological hegemony legitimizes the existing order, no matter how iniquitous it may be. The absence of significant erosion of such ideological hegemony provides those who were previously dominated with the opportunity to mobilize and translate their opposition to structures of domination into effective political action. And in this respect, I would argue that the notion of consent is crucial. We have seen how hegemony, from a Gramscian perspective, is the power to present the interest of a particular class, the bourgeoisie, as the interest of all. The subordinate groups, including the working class, end up thinking that their interests coincide with those of the bourgeoisie in Gramscian theorization and of the counter hegemony Islam in our present society case. In the case of radical Islam and of the war on terror, Gramscian theory seems to apply in two mutual directions offense and defense. ISIS, the self-proclaimed Islamic State, challenges a set of secular ideologies and political movements that failed in the past decades and offers to replace them with its own hegemony. But the historical Arab Islamic State already had its apparatus of hegemony, represented by various institutions, schools, intellectuals, <coughs> agents, and of course the mosque. And he was an educator, urging, inciting, soliciting, and punishing. Just as Gramsci had theorized about hegemony in the case of the historical Arab Islamic State, the dominant individuals, groups, and strata did not rule only through the coercive power of the state or their economic wealth. They could also rely on ideological and cultural hegemony, through which the ruled could be persuaded to accept the system of values and beliefs most conducive to the interests of the privileged groups. I argue that the reformist Islamic movements did not succeed at challenging this cultural hegemony in the Middle East and were defeated by revived authoritarian regimes, which projected ISIS to a wider audience and allowed the jihadist militant group to sell itself as a counter hegemony to our Western model of state. And the Western governments, especially France now, are responding with a waged war on terror Consent for which seems to be just as slippery as in Gramsci's theorization, and very much in relation to coercion and domination. One of its scary failures is the impressive number of ISIS recruits from Europe, probably a disquieting response to the rising levels of racism and Islamophobia. ISIS, or Daesh as we call it, essentially the same, on the one hand is reactionary, trying to restore original Islam, but on the other hand as militants who come from Western universities, and is very skillful at handling Western technology and Western means of propaganda to the point of reproducing the static codes of Hollywood movies. And it's this effective propaganda that attracts the Western militants, certainly not the literal interpretation of the Quran. And journalist Loretta Napoleoni explained that ISIS had the incredible ability to transform its nature. I'm going to read you a quote. From the ashes of the war on terror, therefore, in a post-Cold War proxy environment, the Islamic State has repackaged itself not as a new breed of terrorism, but as a mutation of its former self. Its success springs from the convergence of several factors, among which are a globalized multipolar world, a command of modern technology, a pragmatic attempt at national building, a deep understanding of the psychologies of Middle Eastern and Muslim emigrants, and the long shadow of the West's response to 9-11, which has plunged parts of the Middle East into a decade of sectarian warfare. Ignoring these facts is more than misleading and superficial. It is dangerous. Know your enemy remains the most important adage in the fight against terrorism." End of quote. And Napoleon also explains how ISIS shares the ambitious goals of the founders of the European nation state and articulates such goals in a contemporary and modern way. Another quote, ISIS attempts to fulfill all the requirements of the modern state, territoriality, sovereignty, for now recognized only internally, legitimacy, and bureaucracy. Instead of being satisfied with small and class, it seeks to create a 21st century version of the ancient caliphate and shuns the idea of permanent anarchy. On the contrary, in the conquered territories, one of the first tasks that ISIS carries out is the imposition of Sharia law. So see, we have contradictory things. And the success of the movement suggests that we are stuck in a world of contradictory messages. It reminds me of Gramsci's passage of the contradictory consciousness of the man in the mass consent, which influences his moral conduct and the direction of his will and produces a condition of moral and political passivity. 
Gramsci's analytical framework remains valuable because he has pointed out the painful process of the critical understanding of the self, which always takes place, therefore, through a struggle of political hegemonies and of opposing directions, first in the ethical field and then in that of politics proper, in order to arrive at the working out at a higher level of one's own conception of reality. So both the jihadist militants, stuck in their previous indoctrination, and their targets, stuck in their fear of terror, amplified by the media, are struggling with this process. In a world of hegemonies and counter-hegemonies, they ultimately cannot relate to a unified hegemony, to a unique conception of reality, and struggle to reconcile their theory with their practice. Thanks.